good morning. Well, um, first of all, I'm going to distribute a piece of attendance. Um, so today we're going to cover two topics. So we have a uh, placement for uh, lectures last week also. Uh, so please bear with me, maybe it will take a little bit longer uh, for this class. We'll try to finish it as soon as possible before 12.30 maybe, okay? Um, just like to let you know here, uh, when you sign this attendance, yeah, yeah, two here, okay? One for tutorials, one for lecture. But you have to sign your two colors. One for um, the press of November today, and the other one for this placement. Okay? And I hope you have also uh, scanned your attendance through um, the Smart RDU system. I have provided four links. You have to sign them all. Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to distribute this one to uh, the friends here. So you will be separated um, to the back. Masalahnya aku tidak tahu. Boleh tak nak? Sen dua. Ini dua katanya satu. Here, the last column. This is the trade volumes. 
the fake values here, for example, if you can see that 0 0.012 uh, here, and this is also the same right here, we can, we can call this one as the gravity index. The gravity index, which is determined by the GDP between two countries and also the distances. Yeah. The lower the values, the lower the gravity index means that the trade volume is lower. From here, so we have the pairing, the pairing between Argentina and five countries and India with other five countries. All right. Now, before I talk about that, maybe we should look at the information, the distance here. The distance in these two examples they use km kilometer, okay, and alternatively you can use mile. But what is the difference between miles and kilometers? Are they the same thing? Different. They measure the same things. Measure physical distance. But um, what are the differences between km and miles? For example, let me uh, put here. 1 km is equal to how much or how many miles? Anyone? 1.609. 1.609. Are you sure? <laughs> six, six. 0 0.621. 0 0.621. Right, thank you. This is 0 0.621 miles. Miles usually used in certain countries like the United States, they use miles. In contrast, kilometers are usually applied in um, the United Kingdom and some European countries. Okay? And in Malaysia, we usually use kilometers also, right? We seldom use miles. People don't understand you. Okay, that is uh, a distance, just to let you know. You can use either kilometers or miles, depends, up to you, right? Okay, countries. Let's talk about countries. We have two countries here. Now, I believe that when we search the sources to get the data of the GDP, to get the data of physical distance, you also come across one name, which is some country is called uh, some countries are called countries, but some places they are not called countries. They are called dependency. What is dependency? Dependency here means uh, a dependent territory of a country. It means that this place they are not called countries. They have some sort of depend dependency on another country. In terms of politics, in terms of economics, in terms of social development. For example, um, Pokhalao. Pokhalao is a small state in South Pacific area. This state is a dependent territory of New Zealand. Okay, just an example. Now, uh, I hope you have an idea. What does it mean by dependency? Because uh, some of you might perceive certain island in the ocean, they are country, but actually they are not considered as a country, but dependency. A dependent territory. Okay? Right. Um, now, in this discussion, I'm not going to explain one by one, everyone here. I will just explain the first part, which is Argentina, and you can apply the same uh, interpretation for the second part, which is with India, okay? Now, if I look at these tables, two tables, um, I will come up with three scenarios. The three scenarios, they have different patterns, from what I see. The first scenario is between Argentina, New Zealand, and Argentina's with the United States. Do you see that if I compare these two, 
Okay, this one, you agenda with New Zealand, agenda with United States. You look at the value of trade here, right here. 1.127 and this one is 0 0.012. The things we want to look at here is by comparing the distance, the distance between the Jackinos and New Zealand is approximately uh, 9,900 kilometers, right here, okay? And for between Jenina and the United States, the distance is about um, 8,300, 400 kilometers. Not far away. I mean, these two pairs of countries, uh, the distance are quite close. Compared to others like Argentina and Malaysia, the distance is 15,000 or almost 16,000. Okay? But um, what makes that the value of trade is particularly higher between Argentina and United States compared to Argentina and New Zealand? GDP. It's because of the GDP. If you look at uh, the United States GDP right here, okay, or you can also use this one, right? Compared to New Zealand's GDP, which is quite small. So the high the higher trade volume between Argentina and the United States is attributed by the high GDP in the United States. Okay? That is one scenario. Let's look at the second scenario. Here we can we compare between Argentina and Malaysia, right here. And also Argentina and Singapore. You notice that between these two pairs of countries, the trade volumes are quite close. 0 0.1, 0 0.018, 0 0.020, okay? And this table is even close, almost the same. What makes this happen? First of all, we understand that because Singapore and Malaysia are located side by side, which is quite close. So the distance between this, each of these countries with Argentina is also quite close, which is, um, you can see this value is almost the same, okay? This value almost the same. And what about GDP? GDPs, um, Singapore and Malaysia are quite close also, although Singapore is slightly higher in this case. Right? And consequently, we produce three volumes that are almost the same between uh, these two pairs of countries. But because um, Singapore is slightly higher in terms of the GDP, so the trade volume is also higher. Okay? Right. The two scenarios that I would like to highlight here is. Um, between New Zealand and Argentina, right here. Okay, right here. And also Argentina and Singapore. This is the third scenario we compare. Now, what happens here is if we look at here um, trade volume, between Argentina and New Zealand, the trade volume is 0 0.012. Between Singapore and um, Argentina, the trade volume is about 0.02 volt. In this case, you can see that Singapore has the largest trade volume with Argentina compared to uh, New Zealand. But why? Why this happen? Look, if you understand, if you recognize the population between some Singapore and New Zealand, New Zealand has approximately five million people. And what about Singapore? Almost the same, around 5 million. But because of the Singapore's location as the international hub of international trade, it can generate a higher GDP compared to New Zealand. If you look at the GDP here, Singapore's GDP is um, 0 0.368. 
as 361. Okay, this is measured in um, billion or trillion, I guess. Yeah? Um, if you compare to New Zealand, the GDP is much lower. What about the distance? The distance, if you look at Argentina and New Zealand, the distance is 9,000, almost 10,000 here kilometers. And between um, Argentina and Singapore, the distance is even higher. Right. But uh, the long distance between Singapore and Argentina has been compensated by the higher GDP in Singapore. And consequently, Singapore is still the winner compared to New Zealand and Argentina. Okay? So we can also insert some concept like compensation here. A large distance, yes, it incurs a high a higher transportation cost, but if your GDP is high enough, that could um, cover, compensate the cost of uh, transportation, the long distance. Okay? So um, we have discussed three scenario here. I think um, you can also apply um, the same strategies that I've used to interpret this table with the second part, which is for India here. Okay? You can try this at home. Um, I, I won't um, waste even more time than in this tutorial here. Um, quite straightforward. Uh, I have demonstrated a few examples of how to interpret this table. Um, you can also try to draw a conclusion based on how to interpret this table. In the several scenarios. Okay. Right. Do we have any questions by the way? Okay. Now, since today we have two lectures topics to cover, I'm gonna uh, set the time uh, to go to the next topics. Okay, for the lecture here.
lectures, topics um, two and three. If you have questions in the mind, then at the end of these lectures, I believe you have you will have a better understanding of what these two topics try to deliver to you. Okay. Now what I'm trying to say is, uh, we want to remember two questions. The first question is, how will you gain from trade habits? This is the first question. And that is the question if you remember from the beginning such as the end of this lecture, I believe that you will understand properly what this topic is trying to deliver to you. Okay, that is the first question. When it comes to the next topic, topic three, I also want you to remember um, another question, which is how will international trade affect our income? Remember these two questions at the end of the lectures. We can um, think, we think, or we call these two questions, and what answers you can find from these two topics to answer your question. Okay, that will give you a better um, a foundation. So uh, after following these two lecture topics, okay. Now, when we talk about gains from trade and pattern of trade. These are the two concepts that we try to cover here. Label and competitive advantage. Label, like human capital, is inevitable that we must use human capitals to produce goods and services. But the productivity of labels can be different between countries for a particular production. Let's talk about um, palm oil. Okay. Indonesians and Malaysians, we have the human chemical to produce palm oil. But um, why other countries do not perform as good as Indonesia and Malaysia? Why? The reason is because Malaysia has the capacities to produce or to use the label productively to produce palm oil. Indonesia and Malaysia compared to other countries. Meaning that there are relative productivity between labels in Malaysia and labels in other countries like Thailand or maybe Philippines or something in terms of oil production. Right? Okay, oil production. Relative uh, productivity here means productivity by the way, it means if you can produce something with relatively lower cost, that is productive. Okay? For example, in one day, how many homework can you can you finish? If you can finish a lot, that, is, that means you are very productive. Right? You use uh, your time efficiently. The same applies to label. If the label is productive, that means they can produce a lot of output with relatively fewer or less time. That is productive or less it costs. Okay? So um, labels for a particular production can be different between two countries. Okay? When this happens, we call it relative productivity of label. And we are essentially um, under the realm of comparative advantage. If you see the word here, okay, um, Comparative. Comparative here indicate comparisons. Comparison. You can also call it relative. Relative is also um, attractive uh, to mean comparisons. Yeah. Advantage here implies productivity. So comparative advantage here essentially means the relative productivity between two countries. And that is important because comparative advantage is the factor, is the foundation that two countries engage in international trade in order to mutually realize the benefits. Nobody wants to trade if they don't know if there is any benefits or gains, right? So two countries will engage in trade when they understand they have comparative advantage. 
meaning that both of them can gain some training, can gain some things if they trade with each other. Yeah, remember this point. Okay, let's move on to our quick info today. Now this is B, right? This is very cute actually. Right. Um what does B produce? Honey. 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 And we understand that B is a very hardworking insect in the insect kingdom. And it, it also our good partners in order to produce honey. The only creatures that produce honey, right? Any other creatures that produce honey? No. Right. And they also know a lot of teamwork. Maybe better than humans. We don't know. We just understand that they are very productive in terms of producing honey. And we use them for, to produce a lot of honey. Okay? Um, honey is actually uh, a product that is uh, used for a variety of purposes, from food to healthcare, right? To medicine. But um, in this group, we also try to um, tell you how massive is the production of honey because that involves international trade. Not all countries produce honey. Although you can consider that um, virtually all countries produce honey, but uh, not all countries specialize in honey production. Okay? Right. Which country is the largest producer of honey? China. Here we have um, China is the largest one, followed by Turkey and Iran. Look at this. This is the data I obtained for 2017. And this is um, 543,000 tons. If we wonder how big is this if we involve this number in international trade, how massive is the international trade? Let's consider some. Uh, this, is, this is just the provocative thinking. So um, maybe we do some calculations here, right? One ton, if you wonder how, how much is one ton, is equals to 40 cubic feet. Cubic feet is a measure of volume, right? Okay. 40 cubic feet is equals to one ton. Right. We are trying to imagine if we can put this 543,000 tons of honey inside the containers, these containers, how many containers do we want? Can you do the math? Right here. Do you remember TEU? What's TEU? TEU. Remember? Last time, the first lectures I introduced this. approximately 1,172 cubic feet, which is equivalent to 29.3 tons. Okay, now, assuming the containers are designed to contain honey, how many containers would be needed to contain these 543,000 tons of honey? 18,532 18,000 18,532 Okay, around 18,500 containers to be needed to collect this amount of uh, honey That would be uh, five numbers of containers on the cargo ship Right? Um, yeah, just to give you an idea of the, of the production of honey now, here we understand China is uh, the largest producer of honey. Let's, use, uh, let's talk about other examples. What about uh, perfume? 
which country is the largest producer of the world? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. France. Usually, when we think it's about uh, the film group, we all have an idea, so maybe you don't get Yes, it is. But uh, can you mention which countries? France. Uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, to my understanding, it's not the largest country. The countries that usually greet people is from Zoom. France. France. France is yeah, the largest, followed by um, Spain, and then we have Germany. But do you also know that three of the countries, um, I think it's top 15, come from Asia, Asia countries? Do you, do you recognize which are these three countries? In Asia, they also produce a lot of perfume. Please, yeah. Singapore. Yeah, Singapore is one, of, is one of the top 15 largest producers of perfume. Wow. And another two? Korea. Korea? Korea? No? Yeah. Okay. Korea. Japan. Okay, the second one is Hong Kong. And the third one in Asia, I mean not the top, but uh, it's the top among Asia, okay, is China. So Singapore, Hong Kong, and China also are the top producers of food. Okay, enough for the quick info. Let's move on to our main topic here. Right. The first concept we're going to discuss here is comparative advantage. Now, just now, I have given you a short introduction about this concept. Now, we are moving to a more formal definition. When the opportunity comes to produce commodity X in terms of commodity Y by country A, is lower than the opportunity cost incurred by other countries. This is called a comparative advantage to provide commodity X. Just now I have said that um, if labels can produce an output with relatively fewer time and resources, we call it a productive production. Okay? Now, in this definition, we are considering the opportunity to cost in terms of what we have to let go in order to produce more products. Why we need this um, opportunity cost? Because we have limited resources. With limited resources inside a country, we cannot produce everything we want. Right? We have to decide, we have to allocate our resources to the productions that we believe we can maximize the production. Okay? You can't simply allocate your resources to produce everything you want. Okay, in this definition, it means that country A can produce commodity X by letting go fewer commodity Y compared to other countries. That means country A has a comparative advantage. Country A is relatively more productive in terms of producing commodity X compared to other countries because country A has to let go fewer commodity Y. Fewer opportunity cost, in other words. Okay? Right. Now, this opportunity cost happens because we have limited resources, as I mentioned before. We can look at this example here. Let's consider the productions of honey and the productions of pearl. Both production requires labor. That says that the total labor supply is 5,000. We can use these 5,000 labels to produce either honeys or you can produce growth. Or you can allocate these um, labels, half, half, one, uh, one half produces honeys and the other half produces uh, growth. But that may not be what you want to achieve because you can't maximize the output if you have that, okay? Now from here, 
let's say that you want to specialize either armies or code, if you allocate 5,000 people to produce honey, then you can't produce crowd. Crowd in this example is your opportunity cost because honey is your first choice to produce. And the second choice is, uh, is crowd, right? So what you have to forego in order to produce what you prefer to produce is the opportunity cost. Meaning that when you forego crow production, the amount of crows that you're supposed to produce become your opportunity cost. Right? Okay. I hope you remember this concept because our discussion here will get more and more complicated as we proceed to the um, GM. If you can understand this one properly, then it's good. If you confuse yourself with this one, then you will become even more confused in the coming slide. Okay? Right? When the opportunity costs of honey in terms of crops are different between two countries, one of the countries will have the competitive advantage to produce honey. We are still using the same example, crop and honey. This point means that if you can identify one of the trading countries to have the comparative advantage to produce, to produce honey, then trade would be would happen. Okay? This follows the second point right here. In the second point, it says that comparative advantage implies opportunity for the two countries to structure a trade pattern that is um, mutually beneficial. Meaning that when you have labor resources that you can apply to produce something, you need to understand what your labels can be relatively productive to produce the goods, the certain goods. In this case, we have um, honey and crow, right? If we want to understand whether country A is relatively more productive to produce honey or crow. If we can identify one of the country here, either country A or B, that has a relatively more productive situation to produce honey, then trade can happen or should happen. Because if they trade with each other, then both countries will gain something. Remember the question? How will things from trade happen? That is, we are trying to answer this question from the beginning to the end, right? Okay, now in this table, we are actually trying to understand which country has the competitive advantage to produce money and which country has the competitive advantage to produce growth. If we can identify this pattern, then we should say that these two countries should trade with each other in order to um, obtain the gains from trade. Okay? Right. Now in this table, table one, we have country A and country B. Let's consider honey uh, production measured in ton. Okay? 10 ton for country A, 10 tons for country B. Now in this situation, we want to understand one thing, which is if each country produces 10 tons honey, how much or how many crows that they have to forego. That's why I put uh, the numbers in this last column inside parentheses. Inside parentheses here uh, means that the number of crows that they need to forego. You can consider this one as 200 units of crow, 100 units of crow. Yeah? Okay, let's consider country A. Country A can produce 10 tons of honey. And then, because of limited resources, to produce these 10 tons of honey, this country must forego 200 units of coal. That is the opportunity cost. Okay? What about country B? 
to, pro to produce the chance, the same ten pounds of uh, honey, how many crows, how many units of crows that this country has to follow? One country B? One hundred. One hundred, right? It has to follow one hundred crows. That means the opportunity cost is one hundred units of crows. Okay? Now in this comparison, which country incurs the highest opportunity cost to produce honey? A, right? A incurs a higher opportunity cost because it has to follow 200 units of growth compared to country B. Now you see that country A incurs a higher opportunity cost compared to B. That is an indication of comparative wanting for country A to produce honey of growth. Country A has a competitive advantage in the honey or crow. Honey. 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 Uh, no. Close, close. Maybe, maybe you don't see it at this point. Let's, let's uh, reverse the triangle a little bit, then you will see clearly. Okay? Let's consider this way. Uh, 100, 100. Okay. This is uh, country. A, and this is country B. Okay, we are reversing the table now. We are assuming each country produces 100 units of crow, and we want to know how many tons of honey that each country has to follow. For country B, is very straightforward. If it wants to produce 100 units of crow, it has to follow 10. 10 tons of honey. Correct. Okay. What about country A? Five. Five. Five pound. This is five pound. Now you tell me the opportunity cost. For country B, to produce 100 units of crow, what is the opportunity cost? Ten. Ten tons of honey, right? And what about country A? Five tons of honey. Five tons. Which country has the lower opportunity cost? A. A. That means A should produce crops. Should produce crop, right? And this country should produce honey. B. B. Now you understand the comparative advantage. Country A has a comparative advantage in crop. Country B has a comparative advantage in honey. That is the pattern of comparative advantage. By identifying this comparative advantage between two countries, we can suggest that these two countries should trade with each other because by trading, they will be able to gain from the trade. Now, our next step here is a bit higher because um, we are going to understand a more uh, in depth concept called specialization and relative price. Specialization here means your concentration. What the country concentrates to produce with the limited resources. In other words, what will the country focus to produce? Certainly, a country will concentrate, will focus on producing some things that it has a comparative advantage. Yeah. And let me give price here. Um, I won't give you a definition at this stage, but um, this is a concept that we will apply throughout the rest of the class here, the lectures here, okay, to understand the gains from trade. When we mention gains from trade, that is the, the profit, the revenue that the country uh, gains, right? So we must have price. But under international trade, we cannot just consider the price of only one product. We need to consider, like, because um, we have determined country A uh, focus on crow production, country B focus on uh, honey production. That means there are two prices the price for honey, the price for crow. That means 
when we do international trade between these two countries, the need to consider the relative price between honey and growth. Okay? That is the, the implications of the relative price here. Now, assume a case of two goods here. We are price again x and y for simplicity. Production is limited by the total supplies of labor. I don't know whether it still remembers the concept we learned from microeconomics. We have the budget constraint. Meaning that what we want to buy is limited by our income. And the same applied here. What the countries want to produce is limited by the resources in the country. Because we are focusing on labels here, so our resources is labeled. As you can see here, the big L is labeled. It's also um, the total labels that we have in the country, right? Where um, this on the right side of this inequality, we have um, L X here, L subscript X. This is the person hours required to produce good X. Remember, L here is being label hours. With the subscript X, we need the label hours required to produce good X. And the set of price to LY, this is the label hours uh, required to produce uh, product Y. Okay? And Q and, uh, QX and QY here, Q usually denotes quantity. The quantities of good X that the country aims to produce. And QY is the quantity of good wine countries have to produce. So uh, the multiplications here implies the total labor hours that would be required to produce this quantity of good X, for example. Okay? And also a uh, quantity of good Y. So all together, you might, you might um, feel a bit confused at this moment because uh, when I talk about labels, Maybe we're just thinking about a uh, person. How many people as labels? But do you notice that labels also include um, label hours? How many hours do you denote to work? That also considers label hours, uh, label price. Okay? Um, so the productions of good X and Y, it depends on how many hours of label supply that the country can solicit in order to produce these two goods but limited by L this is the total labor hours in the countries right? okay, we will use the concept production possibility frontier um, this is something to learn from micro and perhaps macro economy also Now, production possibility but here, based on your understanding, is usually a curve like this. This is a PPC. As you learn, PPC, production possibility curve, or you can also call it production possibility but here. It measures um, a different combinations of inputs to produce good Y and X. Okay. Now, when the production possibility function is a straight line, it means that these two goods are perfect substitute. Right? Do you notice that? For example, if I reduce the production of Y a little bit right here, okay, I have to I will be able to increase the production of of uh, Good X right here. Okay? If I reduce the production of Y a little, I will be able to increase the production of X. But because this line is linear, it's a linear line, that means um, the slope here or the changes here is constant. Okay? Now, the implications here for the slope. It implies the opportunity cost. Why? Because if you want to increase some productions of eggs, 
then you have to let go or forego some production supply. That is the production uh, opportunity cost. Okay? Same with what we talked just now. A country like country A can produce uh, commodity X. Okay? By, but this country must let go or forego some commodity Y because of limited resources. Because every point on this uh, every point on this line, this GDF line, indicate that resources has been uh, resources have been fully used. Have been fully used. That means if you want to increase your output for X, that you have to forego some Y. Okay? What you forego is your opportunity cost. And that's why, because this yellow triangle here. Okay, this one, this one actually measures the slope of this line, which is equal to this term. This term. X, Y. The label hours used to produce X divided by the label hours used to produce Y. This is the slope of this line. It's also the opportunity cost to produce x in terms of y. So the language here is if you produce x, you have to you have to focus on y. The language that we use here is the opportunity cost of x in terms of y. That means y you have to you have to focus y in order to produce x. Okay? So not in the change or uh, put this in the opposite way because the meaning will be different, right? Okay, um, now we come to the point to discuss our relative price. Remember, just now I said we have relative price, and now we bring it into this picture, okay? We have, um, we have discussions the production of two products, product X and Y, and we have country A and B. Remember this one? Now, when we use labels to produce some things, we incur the cost. The cost comes from the wages. When we use label, we need to pay the wages. But we want to understand the point, um, what is the wage per hour that we need to pay the labels in order to produce the X, for example. Okay? Because um, to understand gains from trade, we just not um, we cannot just consider the cost. You also need to consider the revenue, the revenue of trade. Where does it come from? Revenue. Quantity times the price is equals to revenue to gain. Okay. That's why we also need to consider the price of good X and the price of good Y because that is the revenue. With the revenue, the firm can use the revenue to pay uh, the label, the wages. Okay? Now, wage per hour in a sector is determined by the values for workers per hour. Just now I said LX is the present hours required to produce one unit of the X. Okay? So the value of an hour's production per worker is equal to the price of good X divided by the label hours for your X. Okay? Right. So the wage per hours will be equal to this ratio. The price divided by label hours. Meaning for each hour, how much that you got paid? It depends on the price that you charge for that product. Because that is where your revenue comes from. You cannot charge the price which is lower than uh, your cost. It will equal loss. Right? So in order to determine how the wage per hour for worker is determined, we need to consider the price that the market charge for the products. Because that is that is where we derive our uh, wage rate to pay the label. Okay. Now, here's um, in the first term in this equation. In the first term, the price the price of good X divided by the label out of good X 
This is high standard price of good wine divided by the latest um, hours for good wine. That means that the wage per hour for good eggs is higher than the wage um, per hour for good wine. This trend means producing good eggs seems to be more profitable. Okay? Why? Because we can we can also we arrange this trend. We arrange this trend to become um, the second term right here on the right hand side. What you see on the right hand side is uh, the relative price. Meaning the price of good X relative to the, to the price of good Y. That is called relative price. Okay, right here. This term. This is relative price. Okay, this is relative price. Okay, right. Do you recognize the second term here? What is the second term here? Do you remember this term? What is the term here? Do you remember what I showed you just now? Right here? The opportunity cost. Okay? This is the opportunity cost of X in terms of Y. Right? Now from this, um, you can see that the relative price of x to y is higher than the opportunity cost of x to y. See that? In other words, the price is higher than the cost. And that is what you want in order to make profit. You cannot produce some things when the cost is lower, is, is higher than the price. Okay? What we have here is, the second term here is, the relative price is higher than the relative cost. I mean, the opportunity cost. And that is the situation to tell you that this country should specialize in producing X. Okay? Right. This is the condition. Relative price of X to Y higher than the opportunity cost of X to Y. This is the condition. The condition to tell us that this country should specialize in producing X, not Y, but X. Okay? Um, this is the point that we got to understand because um, later we will make it more complicated concept by considering two countries. Right? Now from here, maybe we should also understand what happens if the relative price is equal to the opportunity cost? Is there any possibilities to specialize in that case? No. Which is on this point here. When the relative price is equal to the opportunity cost, there is no special, uh, specialization. It is considered as indifference between uh, what the countries to produce the next Y. But this country simply will not specialize in producing X. If the relative price is similar to the relative uh, the opportunity cost. Okay? For the last point here, uh, I'm not gonna discuss, you can test out this the same. Okay? Last point. I mean if the relative price is lower than the uh, is lower, yeah, lower than the opportunity cost. What will happen? Is there any specialization? The concepts, the same concept of price, you can think about this uh, is at home later. Okay. Right. Now here we are bringing in two countries in the pictures. We have two countries here, country A and country B. Okay. Um, if country A is relatively more productive than country B in producing good eggs, this is something we observe. If this coin apply, you will observe something like this. What is it? Okay? The first term here, this term seems to be prevalent to you. What is this term again? What is this? What is this term again? Opportunity cost. The difference here is I have the term A right here. But this term, um, 
for super strict A, the simply um, denotes this is the upper superior cross in country A. So the other side, we have B, sub superscript B. That is the upper superior cross in country B. Okay? Now, from here, so we see that the opportunity cost for country A to produce X relative to Y is lower than in country B. Meaning that to produce X, country A incurs a lower opportunity cost compared to country B. Right? We can also arrange this term to obtain the second one here. The second one here is uh, we want to put the X uh, on the same side for the two countries here. Okay? But they keep the same thing, although we will apply a different term for the second term here. The second term here means relative productivity. I mentioned this early in the class. This is relative um, productivity right here. Okay? Meaning that to produce X, country A is relatively more productive compared to country B. Right? When you observe the second term, the first term applies. When you observe the first term, the second term applies. And it applies in charges. Both of these terms means country A has a lower opportunity cost to produce X compared to country B. In other words, country A is relatively more productive to use its label to produce X compared to country B. Okay? It implies the charges. Um, this production possibility curve is for country B, but if you compare the one just now, this one is steeper. I mean, the slope of this line will have a different information about the opportunity cost. Just now I said, the slope here measures the opportunity cost, right? So, if you have a steeper slide, or you have a greater line, that will give a different information about opportunity cost. A steeper line here means a higher opportunity cost. Why? Because if you look at this graph, you see that if I increase the production of X by this amount, you see that the amount of Y that you have to go is quite, is quite uh, a lot here. Compared to the one just now, um, right here, you see that the slope here is uh, not as steep as the one before. What you have to go is lesser compared to a steeper production possibility curve. Okay? Now since the relative price is so important because it tells us whether uh, the country should specialize or not specialize in one product, then we need to determine, we need to understand how, how to come um, to give rise to the relative price in the world market. Yeah? Um, right here, a single market equilibrium will not apply. Single market equilibrium means we consider only one product. But since we consider trade between two countries and two products, we cannot just use um, the equilibrium point for one product. We have to use both X and Y. That means we need to consider not just the price of good X, but also the price of good Y. So the concept that we're going to use here is to include the relative price, the relative demands, and relative supply. You understand what does it mean by relative price? I have just introduced to you relative price. But um, this could be the first time you look at relative demand and relative supply. The definitions is here. For relative demand curve, okay, relative demand curve, the demand for good X relative to good Y as a function of price of good X to good Y. Usually in demand functions or demand curve, we say that the quantity demanded is a function of price. 
when the price increases, when the demand increases, for example, that is the law of demand, right? As we learn from microeconomics. Well, when we consider two products, two goods here, X and Y, as under one demand curve, we consider it as a relative demand curve, meaning how many good X to demand relative to the demand for good Y. Okay, that is demand under demand. And we also have relative supply curve, meaning the supply of good X relative to the supply of good Y. And this is the function of the relative price. The relative price here is the price of good X relative to good Y. Okay? So the equilibrium condition, as usual, is when relative supply is equal to relative demand. And this is also the crossing point between the relative demand curve and the relative supply curve. Okay? Um, but um, the patterns of the curves that we're going to uh, see could be a bit um, shocking because this is what you observe for the relative supply curve. Usually, the supply curve is up or sloping, right? It's positively sloping. But this is the supply curve you see. It's a clean shape. There's some shape here. Okay? Why it has some um, real look here? This is because of our condition. Do you remember that when relative price of x to y is higher than the opportunity cost of x to y, that is the condition of specialization. Remember that point? And the pattern of this relative supply curve follows that condition. Do you recognize this term? What is this term? This is opportunity cost, right? The option for country A, and this is the opportunity cost for country B. Okay, and our understanding is the relative price of X to Y must be higher than the opportunity cost of X to Y. That is the condition. So when the supply curve is um, flat right here. That means the opportunity cost is equal to the relative price. As I said, when the relative price is similar to the um, opportunity cost here, there is no room for the countries to decide whether to specialize in Y or specialize in X. It's indifferent. So if there is a demand curve that is crossing right here, that means the relative price will be similar to the opportunity cost. We don't want a demand curve that is crossing at this flat motion. Because that indicates the relative price is equal to the opportunity cost. Okay? Right. We want a relative demand curve that is crossing at the vertical motion. Because at this uh, like point one right there, you see that um, the relative price is somewhere right here. Remember, the amount of surprise when they are equal, they will determine the equilibrium price, right? Under this relative demand and relative supply, when the relative demand curve is equal to the relative supply curve, like point one, we determine the relative price right here. And you want to know at this relative price, where the country should specialize in X or Y. From here, based on that equation, um, that conditions right here, you see that relative price X to Y is higher than the opportunity cost, right? Is it higher? This is the opportunity cost. This is the opportunity cost. This is the relative price. Is it um, which one is higher? Relative. relative price or the opportunity cost? Relative price. Oh, yeah. The relative price, right? So this condition fulfilled, which means country uh, A should specialize in commodity X. Right? And what about country B? For country B, we have this equation. Okay? Um, 
You press this. We have this expression. See, uh, first of all, we have determined the relative price right here. Okay, at point one, we have this relative price x y, and this relative price is higher than the uh, opportunity cost of x relative to y, right? Okay, and this is for country A. For country A. And this one, the relative price is also lower than the opportunity cost of x to y for country B, is it right? Because the, uh, because the opportunity cost is located right here, which is higher than the uh, relative price. Okay? So I'm gonna write it here. Okay? This is for country B. Now this um, inequality is the condition. Is the condition that country A should specialize in good X. Country B should specialize in good Y. Why? Because you can interchange this ratio PY here, PX right here. I put it upside down, I reverse up the positions of the price here. Okay, if I reverse it, the ratio this ratio is also equals to the relative price is greater than the opportunity cost of y relative to x. This is this happens in country B. Okay, the same price. So whatever is the case, when the relative price of x is higher than y, uh, sorry, relative price of y relative to x uh, is higher than the opportunity cost of x to y, that means the country should specialize in um, x. Okay? For the other countries, you can reverse the ratios here, the price ratios here, right, this one, and you will get you should get the same condition that the relative, uh, the relative price of y to x is higher than the opportunity cost of y to x. This happens in country B. Okay? Right, um, this is the some things that I just present to you just now. If you have uh, not taken a note, this is the equations that you need to remember. Okay, now we come to the important parts here, which is the gains from trade, answering our question. How will um, gains from trade happen? That is the question we're trying to understand. But to understand this question, first of all, we need to understand the pattern of trade. The pattern of trade is identified by understanding the comparative advantage of each country involved. What is the what is the conditions? What is the conditions for a country to specialize in commodity X? You remember what is the condition? The relative price of X to Y should be higher than the opportunity cost of x to y, right? That is the condition. Okay. To understand gains from trade, we need to understand the status quo. The status quo is the situation. The status quo here means if, for example, the country, they don't trade, like country X, sorry, country A. Country A is specialized in which commodity? X. X, right? Okay, X. Country A is specialized in X, and at the same time, country A must allow the people in the countries to consume Y. But the country doesn't produce Y, then how are you going to let the people who put Y? Okay. You have to buy from country B, right? Because country B specialized in uh, good wine. Yeah. Okay, so we consider, we first of all consider uh, the status quo where country A, I mean, country A doesn't want to trade at all. Country A can, for example, um, produce good wine also. Country A can use, for example, the label hours to produce this unit of good wine. But we understand the fact that country A um, is not 
good kid for you is a good guy. Because safety is a high opportunity cost, right? Ultimately, these countries can produce what it can produce the best, which is the modern tax, right? What about if this country produce eggs and export this amount of goods to country B and you buy country uh, you buy a uh, commodity one from country B? Would that be better? You produce what you can do best and then you export what you produce. You use the money to buy what you want to buy from country B. Would that be even better? Or you produce everything the same? Option A and option B. Option A, you produce what you can do best and use the money by exporting the amount of goods that you export to other countries. Use that money to buy what you want from other countries. Option A. Option B, you use your resources to produce everything you want to produce. Which one do you think is better? A. A is better, right? As I said, relative productivity is different for labor. For example, why Japan? Produce a lot of automobile, I mean cars. Why Japan? Why not uh, other countries like uh, maybe you can consider China? But uh, it's still not as competitive as Japan because they are relatively more productive. Japan produce a lot of cars and they export to world, to every country worldwide. Then they use the money to buy from other countries what they don't produce. For example, do you think Japan produce palm oil product? They don't, right? They need to need to import palm oil products from Malaysia, for example. Okay? If they allocate the resources to produce cars, to produce palm oil products and everything, they would not be efficient. Okay. Um, this term is important because this term means that um, when we export uh, products to other countries, we need to consider the relative price because the price itself is the, the term of revenue. Price times quantity, it becomes revenue. If you don't consider the relative price, then you don't know what value, what revenue that you gain from the trade. That's why. Um, for example, the country produced used these labor hours to produce one unit of um, good eggs and you times the price of good eggs that is into Y that becomes the revenue you gain from exporting good eggs Okay, right, remember that one um, This is the formula to obtain gains from trade From here this is the amount produced, the amount of good eggs that you produce. This is the price. The price times the amount you produce, that is export. When you export your product to other countries, you receive payment. That payment is measured by the relative price. Okay? Um, this is the formulas to um, indicate gains from trade because what you export is supposed to be higher than if you produce the product yourself. Country A doesn't produce Y, right? If it produces Y by itself, this is the amount it gets. This is the amount it gets right here. But if the country produce eggs, specialize in eggs, and then export this amount, this certainly means the left term here is highest than the right term. Okay? It means that what you can import from country B will be highest than if you allocate the resources to produce by yourself. Okay? Right. Now from here, you can rearrange this um, inequality and what you get is exactly this condition. The relative price x, y is highest than the opportunity cost x, y. Do you remember this condition? These conditions will tell us the country should specialize in y or x. 
Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Right. Good. Um. This production possibility curve tells us two information. Now, first of all, we look at the chocolate color here, the brown color curve here. Okay. Now, what you see is CP here means consumption possibility. Okay. Consumption possibility. You know the F is production possibility. The brown line here indicate consumption possibility is equal to production possibility. Meaning, what the country can produce is what is what the country can achieve. Whatever you produce is equal to whatever you can achieve. That is indicated by the brown line here. Okay. This is a situation when the country doesn't trade with each other. When the country doesn't trade with other countries, what you see is the brown line. Whatever the country produces will be consumed within that country. Is that good? That is not good because as a country, you don't produce everything. You need to import some products from other countries also. Right? Um, for example, you need to import uh, cars or motorcycles of different brands. If you don't import, maybe the country still can produce motorcycles and automobiles. But uh, the consumers in the country will not have the choice that make them happier. Can you imagine if we don't import automobiles from other countries? What we can consume here is only locally produced car, is that right? An automobile. And usually consumers are not happy with this situation. They want to have, I don't say that locally produced cars is not good. What I mean is they need a diversified uh, choice. They, they need the papers to have more choices. So import is important. So if you see in this graph, the blue color line here is a consumption possibility. The blue line here indicates if the country also import blue wine from country B. You see that the intercept here is higher compared to this one. Meaning a higher intercept here means more commodity wine can be consumed inside the country. And this situation happens when the country uh, import good wine from country B. Remember that I said um, based on our condition just now, country B specialized in wine, right? Why not let country B produce good wine and then we import from good wine? I'm uh, sorry, uh, country B. That is even better. Okay? So if we import uh, commodity wine from country B, then the blue line here indicate the, consum uh, the consumption possibility. The consumption possibility is higher as now. Okay. The same situation happens to country uh, B. Because country B specialize in Y, they import eggs from country A. That's why if the country doesn't trade with country A, the blue line here is what you observe. The PBF is equal to C B. Okay? In contrast, if country B trade with country A, it will be able to increase the quantity of good eggs for the local people to consume. Remember, country A is specialized in eggs, right? Okay? Country B is specialized in what? Now, country B will import good eggs from A in order for the local people to consume. That is even better, right? Okay, that is indicated by the blue line. The consumption possibility is now uh, wider. Why does that if it doesn't trade, which is indicated by the brown line, right? Okay, let's do some exercise. Uh, this is an exercise I want you to do. Uh, you need to do some calculation. Now, in this table, what I have here is um, 
this is uh, like Malaysia, for example. Okay, so in Florence, it can be any countries, but uh, not Malaysia. In this table, we consider two products here. We have yogurt and cookie. Remember, um, L with subscript Y is the label hours needed to produce yogurt. I use Y here to be no yogurt and H here to be no for example. Okay? One hour per unit. But uh, for cookies, three hours per unit. You can consider as unit here, it can be 200 pieces. Sometimes we confuse. Uh, is it really needed to use three hours um, to produce one cookie? No. What I mean here is one unit of cookies here uh, consists of 200 pieces, for example. It's reasonable to use three hours. Right, and then for, uh, for foreign, this is another country, uh, six hours to produce um, yogurt and four hours to produce one unit of cookies. cookies. Right. Um, if you look at these two countries, you compare home and foreign, you will see that home use relatively fewer hours to produce both yogurt and cookies, right? One hour for yogurt and three hours for cookies. Both are lower than the six hours and four hours in foreign. Now, we call this an absolute advantage, meaning home, is, home has the absolute advantage in producing both goods, both cookies and yogurt, because uh, home use relatively lower uh, labor hours to produce both products. Okay, now that is the term called absolute advantage. Does that mean home and foreign cannot trade? It doesn't mean that home use relatively lower labor hours to produce both goods. Then. Um, the phone has a competitive advantage, and then phone is the winners. There is no room for these two countries to trade with each other. That is a wrong exception. What we need to consider here is a competitive advantage, not absolute advantage. Okay. Now, to find a competitive advantage, we just need to focus on the opportunity cost of yogurt in terms of cooking. Okay, so we have uh, the three questions here. The first one, calculate the opportunity cost of yogurt in terms of cookie for each country. Let's consider who. What is the opportunity cost? Remember, we just need um, this one is Y. Uh, this one is C. And this is for country home. Okay? Country home. What is the value here? One over three. You just need one divided by three. You get? What do you get? One over two. Zero point three three. You get zero point three three three, right? And for foreign? Six divided by, by four. four, and this is the opportunity cost. Okay, um, that means if you use a six hours to produce one yogurt, then you have to forego one point five units of cookies. Why? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, this four is equals to one cookie. These two. Is equal to 0 0.5 cookies. So all together, 0 0.5, all together you got 1.5 cookies that you forgot. Right? What is the next question? Is the relative price of yogurt, um, the price of yogurt relative to the price of cookies located to increase opportunity cost of yogurt in terms of cookie between two countries? The relative price here is 1. Relative price um, yogurt to cookie is equal to 1. And we have the opportunity cost 
which is 0 0.333 and 1.5. The question is, is the relative price located between these two opportunity costs? Yes. Yes. If yes, which country should specialize in yogurt and which country should specialize in cookies? Country home, home should specialize in yogurt. Okay? And the other country foreign should specialize in cookies. Okay? This is what we get from here. This is the condition. Okay? This is given as to uh, price of yogurt price of cookie less than this is uh, y x this is country f and this one is relative uh, this opportunity cost of yogurt in terms of um, cookie this is for country oh same things right okay uh, the next thing we have to Identify just un uh, to answer our last questions here. Uh, how will gains from trade happen? This is the last question. Okay, right. To calculate it, we apply the formulas. The formulas like this: um, one over labor hours to produce yogurt. Sorry, it's, um, yeah, yogurt. And here's we have the times the price of yogurt relative to the price of cookies. This term, this term should be higher than if the country produce cookie by itself. We are consider it because it's very cool. Okay? So, um, how many um, units of cookies that home can produce if home produce cookie by itself? 0 0.33333, right? Okay. We know this is equals to 0 0.333, like this. What about if the country specialize in yogurt and then export yogurt, how many cookies that home can exchange? That is the question, okay? So one over label hour for y, which is equals to one, right? This one is equals to this. What is the letter price again? What? What times what? One. What? That means one is one is higher than zero point three three three. That is the indication. That is the proof. Uh, gain from gains from trade. If you trade, you gain more. If you don't trade, you get zero point three 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 three. Right? Okay. Uh, we can also reverse this situation. We can consider uh, what happens in country uh, foreign. We can also calculate the gains from trade for foreigns using the same uh, strategy here. Okay. Right. Uh, let's do some quick revision. But um, let's try to shorten the time for the next topic, though. Um, but, um, quickly. Mutual benefit can be realized when each country has a in the goods is specialized. What is the term here? When each country has comparative advantage. Okay, when it has comparative advantage. Um, cut, uh, question two: Who will be benefited if gains from trade are realized between the two countries? You remember the blue line and the brown line as well? If you trade, the consumers will be benefited, right? Because uh, consumers will have more choices. Right? Um, question three. Which of the two particular teams of international economics are related to the trade? The knowledge of trade that we have learned today. I mean, this topic. Gains from trade and The, but the comparative advantage between two countries actually uh, the pattern of trade. So you also learn the pattern of trade and the gains of trade. Okay. Question four: If country A has a lower opportunity cost in producing eggs than country B in terms of food, why? 
Which product should the country A specialize? X, right? X. Okay. So the answer is X. Question 5. From question 4, country B should export food Y to realize gains from trade. True or false? True. 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 Because country B has comparative advantage in Y. So country B should also specialize in Y and export Y. Okay? Right. So the answer is true. Okay. Uh, let's, have a, let's have a break for like 10 minutes. We come back for the second lecture.
Okay? Remember the second question that I asked you to remember? What is the second question? The first question is, how do things from trade happen? You answer that question. The second question is, how do trade affect our income? Why? Because we, when after you study here, you join the label course, you are the label owners yourself. Meaning, you surprise your service. You surprise your label hours to produce something. You become the owners of your label hours. But when you offer yourself to work, you receive payment like wages. Or if you are the owners of a piece of land, you also receive payment in the form of uh, rent. And you want to understand how will international trade affect our income as a landlord? As a landlord. Okay. Compared to if we don't do any international trade, what will be the effect? Compared to when we do international trade of the countries, how will that affect our income? That is uh, the question is that we try to answer in this talk. Okay? Right. Can you recognize what is this thing? <laughs> what is the name of this thing? Oil. 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 And oil definitely is one of the major products of trade in the world. That's one of the highlights here. And probably many of you may not recognize which countries produce the most oil in the world. Arab Saudi. Okay, do you see? Or maybe you have already known that. <laughs> which country? Arab Saudi. Yeah, one of them. And or Brunei. Then go back to that. Malaysia. What whole country? Uh, Satu lagi yang aku rasa aku tak tahu. Dubai. Dubai is one of the Middle East countries. I think Dubai is one of the members of OPEC. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's have a look. This is the oh, yes, yes. largest producer of oil in the world. Um, the United States is number one. Oh, yeah. And second, as uh, Kairos mentioned, is Saudi Arabia. And the third one is Russia. And this is also one of the reasons that Russia remains strong in the coal in Ukraine. Because um, they have a lot of oil uh, depository. And a lot of countries depend on Russia, including a lot of these European countries uh, that need to supply from Russia. Otherwise, it is hardest for them to find alternative countries to supply the oil. Okay. Um, let me introduce you some term here. What is NPBL? NPBL. What is it? This is Nero. Nero. But um, some of us must um, may misinterpret this one. You see that there is an M in front of this. You might think this is million barrel, which is wrong. MBBL here stands for thousands barrel, not million. If I put two M in front of it, M M B B L, that is million barrels. If only one M, that is thousand barrels. Okay. Now, um, the quick reports that I would like to introduce here is with this amount of 15,000, 50, um, yeah, 2,000 barrels per day, supplied by the United States alone, every day. Not one month, not one week, but every day, this amount is supplied. The question is, how many barrels is needed to contain that amount of uh, oil every day? One oil barrel contains 42 gallons of liquid. 15, so 15,000 barrels per day is equivalent to 630,000 liquid gallons per day. How many is uh, barrels do we need? 
for this amount? 15,000. 15,000. 15. 15,000 barrels. To be needed, it contains a supply of oil from the US alone every day. You can imagine how many of these barrels to be needed. How massive of uh, the oil industry? Okay? Right. Uh, oil come from the ocean, under the ocean. Uh, we can also consider the ocean itself as land. For example, if the country has the right to build a, an oil platform in the ocean to extract the oil, that means that country owns that ocean to the ocean. That is land. Okay? Um, and today, in this topic, we also consider land as one of the resources in addition to labor to be more realistic. Okay, right. Let's see. This is the cost. I mean, the topic, uh, the structure of this topic, just to let you have an initial um, grab of how we are proceeding um, throughout this topic. First of all, we will learn resources. We will learn about resources, particularly the labels of land between two countries. Okay, because we want to know um, if a country is abandoned in land, for example, what can it produce? And how, how does it trade with um, other countries in order to realize gains from trade, for example? Yeah? And then we will look at the concept of competitive advantage again, but at this uh, topic, it will be more complicated than mentioned just now because we are considering not just one label of resources, but we also consider another resources like land. It will be more complicated, I believe. But uh, if you have a good grasp of your knowledge in topic two, it should be not so much a problem for you to understand the topic here. Okay, and lastly, we're trying to understand this is free. Uh, this address and the same. But uh, anyways, I'm trying to correct this one and actually upload it again on Spark later. Okay, you can get the latest one. Uh, yeah, this is the, the things that I want to answer just now because I asked you to remember another question, which is how do we make our back our income? Okay, throughout this topic, uh, we want to look at the source of You will have uh, an answer of what you can really impact on uh, income distribution. Right, if you are lazy, if you are bad for example. Yeah. Okay, resources. Whenever we talk about resources, we have one thing in mind, which is resources are not unlimited. They are limited. Even renewable resources are limited, to be honest. It depends on how much you can renew the resources, right? And moreover, when we talk about land and labor here, the notions of limited is even more apparent. The number of labels that you have are limited. The numbers of uh, land that you have are limited, right? Because of this limitation, we call it a, uh, a constraint. A constraint to use resources, a constraint to use label. In these two equations, equation one and two, I believe we have already read this one in topic two just now, exactly in set date. But um, what is new here, I add another equation right there, where we use N to denote um, Land. And stand for land right here. Okay. And this small letter N subscript X is the unit of land required to produce good X. The same concept applies to LX. LX is label hours required to produce a unit of good X, right? In the same price here, the small letter N, X, is the unit of land required to produce a good X. Same price. So, the combinations of use here, the locations of land are located to produce X and produce Y, 
should not be exceed, should not should not be more than what is available in the country. The big end here is the availability of land in the country. How you use the land cannot be exceed what you have in the country, right? So this is the basic two equation for the two resources here, land and labor. Now let's move on and look at this. This is the standard pattern of production possibility plunging, which is a concave. Okay, this is a concave uh, line. Just now we see um, in the previous topic, we see that the PVF curve is a straight line like this. Because we consider only one, one factor of production, which is label. And in the previous case, we consider that Y and X are perfect substitute. That's why we have a straight PVF curve. But in this case, we have considered we have considerate two resources, label and lab. And the likelihood for these two products to be perfect substitute are less likely in the sense that we can allocate um, label and land differently in different combinations to produce A and Y. And that's why we have a curve or concave to be here. Okay? Right. Have you noticed that the slope here is different? Look at the slope. It's different, right? It's not constant anymore. This uh, situation means that, for example, if you consider this part and this part smaller and this one is bigger meaning that if you try to increase the output of x from here you let go or you forego relatively you will put y but uh, the more good x you produce such as this portion right here okay you will have to forego more good y you see that this part is bigger. This is because if you continuously produce good X with your resources, eventually you will, you will reach a state of maximum production. And this um, maximum production, if you keep pushing, you want to produce more and more and more, then you will incur uh, a back crash in the sense that you will have to let go or for more, more good Y. Right? This is the notion of increasing opportunity cost. Because you see that the more good eggs you produce, the increase uh, the opportunity cost in terms of following good eggs, uh, sorry, good Y, will become bigger, bigger, and bigger. Right? This is the notion of production cost of the plant here with increasing opportunity cost. Okay? Um, there is a question in the sense that um, I think I ask here what if inputs are not substitutable? Meaning, you cannot substitute more than for label or vice versa. Meaning, you cannot substitute uh, or compensate label and lab. In that situation, um, how will the PBF look like? This is how it looks like. Um, you can see that for the label constraint, for the label constraint, actually what you see is from here to here, which is one part is green color and the other part is purple color. And for then the lead constraint right here, you see that one portion is purple color and the other portion is green color. But all together, you see where this two line cross at this point, at this point, the PBF that you obtain is only the green one. Sorry, uh, yeah, the green one and the purple one right here. The king shape right here, right here, and the purple right, right here. But what I mean is, at this point right here, uh, it's, uh, it's corner, it's not round, 
This point means that there is no substitution between them and a label. We cannot substitute them. They must be used in a fixed proportion. Maybe um, 100 hectare of land with uh, 5,000 labels. The fixed in this portion. Okay? This is a situation. This PDF covers uh, land and label cannot be substituted. Right? Now, using the standard PDF just now, the red one is our uh, standard PDF with the concept pattern. We introduce one concept for ISO value. The ISO value here means the values of output produced using land and label. Okay? The PBF indicates the different combinations of foot Y and X that could be produced using land and label. The ISO value line here means the value of output that you can produce. Right? So this point, the tendency point of PBF and the ISO value at point E right here, this indicates maximum production. It looks quite similar to uh, ISO trend and ISO cost in microeconomics. But uh, the term that we apply here is a bit different because we also have ISO value lines. The ISO value lines is something to be used in international economics here. Um, this is the definitions of ISO value line. The value of output is constant. Now, this is the equations here. We, we stand for value, the value of output which is equal to the price times the quantity of good X, the price of Y times the quantity of good Y. Looks very similar to the budget constraint. Remember, uh, budget constraint means our expenditures cannot be more than our income allocation. We allocate 100 or 1,000 ringgit to buy things, but our expenditures cannot more than 1,000 because that is what we allocate. And the same concept applies here in the ISO value line. Meaning, um, for the value of output, it should be similar to um, the price times the quality of each product. Okay? Um, you see that in this diagram, the green line, the solid green line, is downward sloping. And actually, we can derive a function to represent this ISO value line. The function here is obtained like equation 3 here. We just rearrange this, um, the first equation in order to get the second equation. In the second equation, we have the quantity of y as a dependent variable. Why? Because in this diagram, we have the quantity of y here on the y-axis. That's why we want to obtain the quantity of y as a dependent variable. Okay? And look at this. This green line is downward sloping, is negatively sloping. That means uh, the slope is negative. We want to prove this one on the equation, the function just now. So from here, we just rearrange this equation. What we obtain is the second equation here, right? And look at this. This is negative p x over p y. We have a negative here. Negative here means negative slope, right? Do you um, remember this term, p x over p y? What is this? Relative price. Relative price. This is the relative price we apply to start the previous topic, and you understand how important to have this relative uh, price because it tells us. Um, the conditions of specialization, right? Okay, um, we will still apply this negative price here, but uh, additional information that we get is, is this a negative term here, representing the ISO value line. Now, um, we're going to talk about input intensity. Because we are talking about uh, two resources, land and um, labor. Between two countries, A and B, and we believe, in the sense that the endorsements of resources among countries are not the same. 
like I mentioned just now between Malaysia and Singapore, Malaysia has more land, right, compared to Singapore. So, if there are differences in the endorsement of resources between countries, we want to find out where is that country is intensive to labels or land or capitals or whatever, uh, just to, to, um, to determine where is the countries can use the, uh, the intensive resources to produce, the goods that is um, under its specialization. That sense. Okay? Right. Um, should the producer use more label and less land, or more land or less label? The answer it depends on the relative input price. Um, this is a new concept that we introduced here. Thus, uh, in the previous lecture, we consider relative price, and I said that uh, the relative price must be higher than the opportunity cost in order to um, for the countries to specialize in that product. Of course, the price should be higher than the wage, right? Um, in that case, we only consider the opportunity cost. But here, we introduce an additional concept, which is the, um, the relative input price. What we're trying to show here is that the relative input price will have a hand-to-hand well, -hand relation, a hand-to-hand -hand relation with the relative price, meaning that if the relative price of X to Y increases, the wage to label us, uh, I mean, the relative input price will also increase. It has a positive relationship. Why? Because, of course, if um, the relative price increases, I can pay a higher wages. And vice versa, if, uh, if uh, labels demand a higher wages, I need to charge a higher price. Right? Um, but um, the relative input price and the relative price will indicate, will show us the intensity of use of resources in production. Okay, let's see how this happened. Right, um, but first of all, you need to remember as the concept here, the real indicate wage rate and we indicate capital rent. I believe you have uh, understanding of wage rate, but uh, capital rent, capital rent is just a general reference of uh, payment. For example, if you own a piece of land, um, you might rent it or you might um, use the land for plantations or whatever and the payments that we receive is usually called rental or for rent okay? Now, the relative input price is written in this way it means that it is a wage rate divided by uh, the rent okay? From here, uh, this diagram is actually quite interesting we have x and y, meaning that we still use the same assumption um, commodity x and commodity y. We have country A and country B, right? Uh, these two lines indicate us the intensity of use, meaning when commodity x is label intensive or land intensive. Label intensive here means it uses more labels to produce. Land intensive means it uses more land to produce. Okay, now on this axis we have the input um, relative input price, wage to uh, rent. Okay, and on the x axis we have the ratio, the intensity ratio, land to label. Remember, n denotes land. Okay. And L denotes labels, right? So N over L is the relative use of land to label. Here in the middle here we have two lines, the X and Y. X is commodity X, Y is commodity Y. From here you see that the more we move to this side, the more we move from left to right, okay, from here. We use more land or label? Uh, land. If we look from this zero to that side, we use more land or label? Land. Okay. We use more land relative to label. Right? 
Okay. So between x and y, which one is more than intensive? Y. Y is more than intensive because it's located on the right side of x. Yeah. So x is more label intensive. From this graph, we identify which product is land intensive, which product is label intensive. Y is land intensive, X is label intensive. Right? Okay. You move um, a step forward. This now I say the relative price and relative input price has uh, have a one-to-one -one relation. So from here we can't see it. We will expand this graph with an additional information. Right here. Okay. From here we have the relative price of this site. This is the relative input price. We want to see how the one-to-one -one relation between relative input price and the relative uh, price here will affect the input intensity of each product. Okay. Now, if you look at this blue line labeled as S here, it is um, it seems to be upward sloping on this side. It's upward sloping on this side, meaning that if the relative price increases like this, the relative input price also increases. Do you see that? Do you see this one-to-one -one relation? The increase in relative price also encourage the increase in relative input price. Okay? We want to ask how will that affect the input intensity to produce X and Y? If the input price increases, how will that affect the intensities of land and labels to produce X and Y? That's the question we want to ask. Can I from here? You see that for commodity X, when input price increases like this, There is an increase along this uh, line here, okay, from this point until this point. There is an increase right here. Um, the movement from this point to this point does it produce more land or label? Land. 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 Because N over L not increase to this point, okay, this point here. The increase in this ratio, which to um, rent right here, meaning that wages, I mean, labor become more expensive. You see that um, here, from this point until this point, the relative input price increases, right? It means wages become more expensive. And hence, this will encourage the producers in the countries to use more land instead of label. And that's why we see that um, the ratios of land to label increases from here until here. Right? That makes sense. And this happens to be for commodity tax that is um, just now we say this is uh, label intensive. But what about commodity Y that is land intensive? When the relative input price increases from this point until here, we see the movement on the white line from here until here, like this. And what does it imply? We say Y is land intensive. The increase in wage will further encourage the use of more land in the production. That makes sense. Okay? That means Y will use even more land in the production compared to labor. Right? Because Y is already land intensive. The increase in the wage for labor will further push the use of more land for uh, production of Y. Okay? Alright. Um, the next thing you have to consider is the location. With land and label, we need to consider um, in what situations that the, allocate, uh, the allocation is maximum or optimum. Whatever is the case, the, the resources of the countries should be fully used. The keywords here 
um, the resources available in the country must be fully used, or near to fully used. Otherwise, there is no way for you to understand whether the allocation is efficient or not efficient because you don't even fully utilize your resources. How are you going to uh, make sure that the allocation is efficient? That doesn't make sense. On, on the one hand, you have a lot of uh, resources unused. And you say that I can allocate a portion of resources efficiently that, that uh, it doesn't match. Whenever you want to achieve a maximum efficiency, the resources must be fully used. That is, uh, that is um, efficiency. Okay? But um, for this analysis, we'll try to use a concept called Edward Box. Do you still remember the Edward Box in microeconomic tool? I don't, I don't, uh, you still keep your microeconomic tool notes, so you have all these uh, true or notes. I don't know. Yeah. Do we still apply the concept here, the add to the box? Right? Do we still recognize this box? Yeah. This is uh, the box we use uh, in micro tool and we apply here. Right? That's why there's one reason that you must, uh, you must have taken micro tool before you take international economics. Because some of the concepts will be applied right here. Okay. This is an um, expert box that we apply. What we try to analyze here is um, the locations of resources. Right. Mm, you, if you look at these equations again, sorry, this uh, graph again, what I, what I do is I just try to rotate um, the white line with the opposing corners. So, what you see in this edgeworth box is this is the point of origin for product, uh, product Y on the opposite corners. You can see that. This is the corner for X, this is the corner for uh, Y. That's why we have the, the line that extended from this point downward and crossing the X line at this point, which is um, E right here. Now, how to read this? Uh, Edgeworth box. From here, we have the points of origin of X right here. Okay. Um, this vertical axis measures the quantity of land. The quantity of land right here. The more you go up to this point, the more you go up here, the more land you use. And for the horizontal axis here, this is measures label. The quantity of label. The more you move to the right side, I think here, the more labels you use. Okay? And the seller price from this corner, if you move to the left side, you use more uh, label. And if you move to if you move downwards right here, you use more land. No matter what, the vertical axis measures land. The horizontal axis measures label quantity. Okay. Now, this crossing point happens to be at point E right here. This point means the production of X will use this amount of land and this amount of label to produce. Just now, I, uh, just now we identified that X is label intensive. You can see from this box. The number of uh, label here is more than land, right? Label here is used more than the quantity of land used. This is a uh, label in acid. Okay? And on the opposite side, we say that Y is land in acid, correct? As you can see here, this is the quantity of land used to produce Y. And what about uh, label? This is the quantity of label used to produce Y. Okay? Why use relatively fewer label compared to land in the production? X use relatively more labels compared to land. So from this picture, it's very clear that X is label intensive and Y is land intensive. Just a different ways to look at uh, what we have 
they are side by side x and y line. Uh, okay? This is a different look. Now, I will introduce another question here. Meaning, if uh, we have additional quantity of label, how will that affect this diagram? For example, it could be that uh, there is an increasing flow of immigrants, um, foreign workers to their countries. So that will significantly increase the quantity of labels available in this country. How will that affect this diagram? Just now I said um, X is label intensive, right? Now, if there is um, an inflow of additional labels to the country, how will that affect the production of X and Y? That is the question. Okay, let's see. I simply extend the box to the uh, left side to make it longer. Why? Because uh, remember, the horizontal axis measures quantity of label, right? When I say there could be additional quantity of labels into the country, that means the horizontal axis will become longer. The entire box will become longer because the horizontal axis measures the quantity of label. Okay. Now, um, this box you see that the blue and purple line extended from the point of origins right here. If we have a longer box, the new box right here, that means we will have a new X line extended from the point of origin right here. This is the previous one. This is the previous. This is new. Okay? This is new. So from the new points of origin, we have a new X line, which is the production line for good eggs. That crosses the blue line right here. This is the new equilibrium point. This is the new equilibrium point. This is the old one. Okay? Because X is label intensive, we see that uh, there will be a further increase in the use of label in the production. But at the same time, this new crossing point also implies this country has also increased the number of land use. Because of course, if you want to bring in more labels into the countries to produce this and that, certainly you must have the capacity to locate this label. That means, um, for example, plantation, you will have enough land to accommodate this new amount of labels. If you don't, why don't you bring in? What, why do you think it? If we have enough capacity for uh, accommodating the new amount of labels, um, then why not? Why not bring in more labels? Right? That means if new labels enter the country, that will also encourage the more use of land. Because uh, with more labels, certainly you, you need more land. Otherwise, some of the labels will be left unused. Okay. Now, um, for country, sorry, for commodity Y, that is land intensive, you see that in this new equilibrium, it actually reduces the use of land a little bit right here. This is a new equilibrium, a uh, new point here. But uh, it also reduces the use of labels in the production of Y. Meaning, in this consideration, we know X is labeled intensive and we know Y is land intensive. When there is inflow of additional amount of labels um, added to this uh, production, more land and label will be allocated to produce good X. But at the same time, um, this will negatively reduce the amount of Y produced, meaning um, the production of Y will be reduced because the use of land and this um, label to produce Y will decrease. This is a situation when um, there is a, a force, a force that will change the picture here. 
when X is already labeled in MZIP, if, you, if we add more labels to the country, that will exaggerate the production of X, but reduce the production of Y. Okay? That is the relative effects here. Okay? Right. Um, this production possibility curve here means exactly the same things I depict here, but this is just a different way to look at the situation. Um, we have the production of Y and production of X. Remember that the tendency point here always indicates um, an equilibrium or an optimal uh, condition when production is maximized. Okay? Now from here, um, just now I said when we add more labels to the country, that will increase the production of X but reduce the production of Y because X is label intensive. That generates a relative effect that will reduce the production of Y. Okay? From this picture, what we see here is when we add more labels to the um, country, the production of X increase significantly. You can see here. And at the same time, we also increase Y, but relatively smaller. Relatively smaller, right here. And based on the equilibrium point here, um, the production of X actually increases by this amount, right here. But it reduces the production of Y. This is the relative effect that I made just now. When X is already labeled in Brazil, if you add more labels to the productions in the country, if you accentuate the productions of X increasing significantly, but um, the relative effect will reduce the productions of Y right here. Okay? Um, now, we are ready to move on to the next one, which is the international trade here. We have to consider a lot of our resources, and from here, we will consider the impacts and um, the notions of international trade here. We consider the trading between two countries, A and B. Okay? Country A is home, and country B is foreign. We also assume some similarity between these countries. Yes, assumption is important because uh, when you do an analysis like this one, um, usually it cannot be 100% uh, realistic because uh, most of the time we need to put some assumptions in order to simplify the analysis here. For example, we have similar patterns. Uh, we also have assume similar technologies, productions like this. And the difference between these two countries, country A, higher labels to that ratio than country B. So country A is labeled abundant and B is then abundant. Please remember the keywords right here, for example, label abundant and then abundant. When I say label abundant here means country A has relatively more labels compared to that. Okay. And vice versa, when I say land abundant, it means country B has relatively more land than label. Like in New Zealand, New Zealand has a lot of uh, land. For example, if you count the number of sheep, you know sheep? Yeah, the number of sheep in New Zealand is more than the people, it's more than humans there. Because they have a lot of land and fewer label. And they both, yes, carry more than land, like I'm preparing here, this is our assumption. You just need to remember the keywords like label abundance, uh, land abundance, because um, maybe you have to encounter these kind of questions in midterm for final exam, okay? Good X is label intensive, whereas Y is land uh, is land, uh, intensive, just uh, similar to our understanding just now, X and Y line, okay? With these assumptions, we have to look at um, the analysis here. We are moving towards understanding um, the questions that how will trade affect our income? 
Here we have land and labor. If we are labor owners, our income is wages. If we are land owners, our income is like uh, rent. We want to see how the trade will affect our income distribution. Will that make our income worse off relative to other countries or make our income better off relative to other countries? Okay, in that sense. Now from here, um, you have land relative demand here and land the supply here. Now you might be a bit confused right here uh, because uh, the land is brighter now is not the smoking, it's not the king chef just now. I have uh, shown you that you have the relative supply to like this one, okay? And now we have a relative supply to that look like this one. In the previous case, we used the gene shape of the supply curve to determine uh, whether the uh, biggest possible um, specialization, like the relative price is higher than the opportunity cost, something like that. And we also consider just one um, resource label. In this case, we are different because this is the world market. The world market um, demand is price. That's why we still have to double the demand curve and upper supply curve in order to determine the world market price and quantity. Now from here, um, you see that for country A, we know country A is labor intensive and therefore country A will specialize in X, right? Okay, from here um, we see the quantity is determined to be right this point and for the relative price at home, A is for country, remember, and the price is determined right here. But we also have another equilibrium point for the other country. The foreign country, you see that, um, maybe I should put here, uh, this is for home and this is for foreign. The price for foreign, this is the price for home. Which one is highest, home or forest? Forest is highest, right? The foreign price is highest than home price. Then why not take on what you produce to forest? Because you can get a higher price. Like I said, when I see the price in foreign country is highest than home country, I will produce that good and export to that country because I want to make more profit. Yep. Okay, so this will happen. This is uh, a motivation, a motivation for all country to specialize in eggs and export eggs to country, uh, the foreign country. Okay, the same thing happens to um, foreign country because we look at this one as relative price x to y, but from the perspective of foreign country, we look at the opposite side, meaning. The relative price of y to x, if we are making it, what do you say, um, reverse the ratio, the reverse the ratio, y to x now. If we are in foreign country, we reverse the price ratio, y to x. So when, when foreign country look at what happens in home country, the similar things happen. The relative price of y to x is highest in home country compared to foreign. So foreign will uh, specialize in Y and then export Y to home country because the home country offer a higher price. You see that? These two countries specialize in different routes. They export to each other because of the price differences here. But over time, these two prices will converge these two prices will converge into one point, which is the point Z right there. When two countries trade, the price will become, uh, home country's price will increase, and foreign country's price will decrease until they become the same in the world market. Okay? This is, uh, the question is, will there be any impact on our income? Do you remember the relative price here, X to Y, go hand to hand with um, the input price. Just now I, I, I have explained. When input price, uh, sorry, when the relative price increases, the input price also increases, right? 
That means it will affect our income as a resources owner. Right? We want to see how will that happen now. Now this is a situation when I said the PPR is tangled to the ISO value of budget constraint. That is the point of optimum production. But this point also implies one important concept right here. It also implies one important concept, which is that the price of food eggs times the quantity of consumption of food eggs plus the price of food Y times the quantity of consumption of food Y should be equal to one thing, which is the price of Y times the quantity of production of eggs, sorry, the price of eggs here, and plus um, right here, right? The price of Y times the quantity of Y. That equation means the value of consumption should be the same with the value of production. Okay? Which is point E right there. And from this equation, we can rearrange it to make it look like something uh, like this. DY minus QY equals to the relative price here, Y, okay, QX minus EX. Now when I put, okay, you have to remember the term here, D here means consumption. D here means consumption. And Q here means production. When consumption is less than production, what happens? When consumption is less than production, that, that implies what you produce is not enough to accommodate the quantity that the people want to consume in their countries. So what do you, what, what are you going to do? The consumption of Y is more than production. How are you going to meet this requirement? Uh, you have to buy from other countries, right? When you buy from other countries, what does it mean? Import or export? Import. 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 That means you import quantity Y from foreign in order to meet the excess uh, demand here. When this is, um, if we put D in front here before Q, that means um, demand is more than supply for Y. Okay? And the same thing happens on this side. I put, um, actually, this equation is the same with um, the equations here. Okay? It's easier for you to read. Just now I said this one is uh, equal to import. What about this? I put Q in front of D. We need supply is more than demand. When supply is more than demand, what can you do? Well, you export. You export the quantity X to foreign. Okay? But you have to times the relative price here because uh, relative price here is the value of export. In order to get the value of the revenue of export, you need to times the relative price. Okay? This is something we learned uh, in the previous topic also. Okay. I know you are tired. Uh, actually, I feel even more tired because my legs are actually really hard now. I'm still standing for nearly three hours. Okay, please give me another um, maybe 10 minutes because I just have uh, two more slides, okay? Two more slides. Um, this is actually uh, a slide that answers the question. The next question, which is how do you trade or break our income? Okay, right from here, we have the rule of thumb that we need to uh, consider here. A trade could lead to convergence of relative price. Remember, uh, just now we said relative price has a one to uh, hand to hand relations with the input price. When relative price x to y increases, that will increase the wage to rent uh, input prices. Yeah? 
So changes in liability price means earnings to labels and land orders will be affected. But this is the rule of time, a rule of time that you got to remember here. One, usually orders of abundant practice of the countries are better off. If a uh, country A or home is label intensive, that means that country is a uh, they are abundant. And usually, when trade happens, labor will be benefited in terms of uh, wage. Do you remember us here? Um, right here. Right, right there is point. Previously, this is the relative price, yeah? And with trade, the price will go up. The price will go up. From here, remember when the price go up, from this point, what happens to the wage to rent ratio? Increase. Increase also. If I am the label owner, I mean, uh, I am one of the label, and that country is labeled in Kansi. When my wage rate increases, that benefit, that makes me better off, because I have higher income. If there is no trade, this might not happen. And I don't get uh, additional wages. In international trade, this is what I get. I get a higher wages. Okay? But uh, this depends on whether that factor is labeled, uh, is, is abundance or not abundant in the country. The rule of thumb is if you are the owners of abundant factors of the country, you will be better off. But um, if you are the owners of scarce, factors of the countries, likely you will feel the worst off. This is the situation. Okay? Uh, this is also some of the times that people will protest uh, against the government, the lobbies against the government, who says that um, you should restrict uh, international trade because my business is not affected. Right? This is the situation. Uh, usually this business is not the kind of uh, big business or maybe small, smaller business or something. Uh, this can happen. Uh, three causes the relative input price converge to uh, converge across country and the equalization factor price. What we see here, the convergence to one, one price here is called equalization of uh, yeah, factor prices. Okay. But um, let's say you are the owners of the scarce resources in the country. Uh, based on what we uh, analyze here, international trade will make us worse off. But we don't have to feel has a pessimistic about this law because when you feel worse off in your country, it's actually this is what observe, what we observe. The price of abundant factor in country A becomes similar to the price of star factors in country B. Okay, this um, something when you feel good in this country, you make worse off in other country. When you feel worse off in this country, you feel uh, like better in other countries. That is what. Okay. Um, yeah, this is just the, uh, the opposite side here. The price of scarce factors in country A becomes similar to the price of abundant uh, factors in country B. Yep. Okay. So I hope um, this summary will give you an idea how international trade will affect uh, the income distributions of resources in the country. Right? But uh, what I think is the most important thing is these two points that you have to remember. The rule of thumb, remember here. When it belongs to the, to the labels, abundance or land abundance will be um, the question of interest. Okay? Right, um, this is fine. I'm not going to talk about this one, just some um, additional information for this here. Okay, before we dismiss, just get into a quick freeze. When the substitutions between two inputs is not possible, the PVF is A, 
What shit? The king shit. Right? The king shit. Okay. Right, uh, next next question. When two countries trade, how will that influence the relative prices between the countries in the world market? Language or language? Remember the point Z over there? Okay, one price increases, one price decreases. Converge, right? Okay. Converge. Number three. Under the budget constraints in international trade, budget constraint, the value of input should be equal to the value of export. Remember the question I showed you just now? True. Right here. When I put P um, Y in front of Q Y, this indicates import of export. Import. Okay. So this country form will import Y, but here you see that QX is located on the right side of B. That means supplies of X is more than demand. This happens to be an import or export. That means these countries will export good X, right? Okay. So the amount of good X that the country export will be the money that the countries can be used to import good Y. Right? This is exactly what I tell you in this question. Right here. You import Y because demand is more than supply. You export X because supply is more than demand. So you times the price here, it becomes the revenues of the export. The revenues of the export will become the income of the country that can be used to buy Y from country uh, B. For foreign country, yeah. Okay. Um, question four, right here. This is true. What does this expression mean? Okay. Remember, this is E four. Okay. Last question. Between put X and Y, where X is label intensive and country A is more abundant in labor supply. Then other inputs that uh, then other inputs that country B. Which commodity should this country spe uh, specialize in export to country B? X. X for what? X. It should be X. What good? X is label intensive, and country A is label abundant. Country A should specialize in Y or X. X. X, right? So country A should also export X, X to country B, right? And the opposite happens to country B. B should be land intensive and specialize in Y, and then export Y to A. Yeah. Okay. Right. Excellent. Very good. Um, Time for me to check the rest. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will recite this slide, I mean, I will upload uh, the new corrected versions of this slide on Smart Korea as you can get the new one. And I will also upload the new corrected slides over there. Um, yeah, that's it. And don't forget to submit your group registration for the group project if you have. Um, I will update that also on Smart Korea as well. Okay. Right. Thank you so much for today's long class and see you next week. Take care of the